There has been a one constant throughout all of naval aviation history. If in doubt, someone is going to claim that you don't need aircraft carriers and you don't need a navy because you have land-based air. Usually long-range land-based air. It happens so often in naval history, it's practically a running meme and a running joke. And this series will deal with, well, at least two examples of it going through. Almost universally, when this happens, there is an oh sugar moment very shortly afterwards. Maybe not that shortly afterwards, but in the case of the United States, it came six months later. when a little thing called the Korean War broke out. Look, the constant theme of history is always that people want to cut spending on the fence. In fact, it's a constant. If you're not a dictatorship, you want to cut spending on the fence. The reason you want to cut spending on the fence is you want to spend things, on money on programs where you ever want to lower taxes. And you want to, or you want to spend money on programs which are going to be more immediately visible to your voters, and therefore more likely to lead to your re-election. Sometimes you want to do both. Sometimes you really do want to do both. And at the moment, the year of the aircraft carrier is penciled in for next year. It might become the year of the aircraft carrying the flagships. Mainly because of the way I want to take it in, but also because I want to keep the key ship series running. And I am starting to produce some aircraft carriers into here. And I, and I like putting aircraft carriers in a bit of key ships. But see, the thing is, the larger videos that would be the year of technology ones, the, like, well, the equivalent of the year of technology, it's the 75 minute ones, rather than the uh, <coughs> aiming for 20, 30 minute ones uh, would include a lot more details. And for example, the CVA, uh, the CVA 58 one would also include something called the Revolt of the Admirals. And all the discussions about naval aviation that went on in that period. The fact is. The cancellation of the ship is an absolute cut and dry case of how not to manage a situation. The keel is laid. There is a huge ceremony of keel laying. There always is. Of the United States. An aircraft carrier called the USS United States. And five days later, five days later... Lewis A. Johnson, the then Secretary of State for Defence, cancels it. Cancels the ship. Now, let's be honest, that is a massive blunder on a political scale, because you've literally just spent all this money, started laying down this ship, and now you're just going straight to the cancel button. A sensible politician, a sensible politician might have pressed the pause button. Might have said, look, information has come to light. We've got all these decisions being put forward. The Air Force is putting forward this whole thing that they are nuclear deterrent is entirely going to be long-range bombers. That we do not need to have these things. And um, this, this, I would like to pause the construction of this carrier while we work again to refine, and better refine its mission and purpose to ensure that we get the carrier we need. There you go. That's a lovely statement. Going to pause construction. Wait a couple of months. We've decided that we need to completely, completely rethink where we were going on this. Hello, tail. You wagging your tail? You like that idea. You like that little sort of political response. You think that sounds good. You would like a biscuit. Okay. You you feel you 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 and your tail came up with that. Okay. There are options. There are options beyond going straight for the nuclear one of, well, appropriately for a nuclear for the nuclear bomber carrier of cancelling it completely. But that is what he does, and 
basically, he ends up sort of making the case that he's cancelling it because the Navy and, to an extent, the Army are no longer going to be necessary with the nuclear deterrence of the Air Force. And, of course, six months later, Korean War breaks out. Turns out you can't use nuclear weapons and just bomb, uh, bomb them. You have to actually fight them. And, oh, sugar! Our airfields aren't in range. Oh, sugar. Life happens just sometimes. Just does. So. Shameless book plug. Because, well, I haven't finished any other book to put up yet. And um, also, second edition of this is out. And, um... Well, I might ch have chosen to be a historian. I might consist mostly of iron brew by this point. But I do actually like to eat solid food occasionally. And it's getting expensive, as it is for all of us. So, shameless book plug. Thank you. So, I call it Return of the Flat Top. Now, some people like to tell me it's a flush deck carrier. It is. But that's its official name, not its being rude name. Flattop is its rude name. And here is the interesting thing, because I, as a naval historian, will tell you this is possibly one of the worst carrier designs ever conceived. It's big, it's glorious, it's so, so interesting to look at. But I can actually think of a dozen reasons for cancelling it before even we get to the whole... It's a nuclear carrier. I would say the lack of an island structure. I would say the fact that it can only operate within a conventional carrier battle group as the strike carrier as long as the other carriers are assisting it. The fact it's going to need an entire command ship to support it, but probably let's be honest, that's going to be the task force command ship. You are pretty much recreating HMS Ark Royal in the Royal Navy's doctrine from the 1930s without it being as pretty. In that your regular fleet will carriers, your midways, your Essexes, they're your battle carriers, like the illustrious class was supposed to be. The ones which were gonna be and uh, do the main uh, the fighting of the fleet. And then the United States is your strike carrier. Like our Royal was gonna be. But whereas Ark Royal could defend herself, could coordinate her own air group, etc., this can't. Another thing to think about with this is it's basically an arsenal ship. You can make that case quite convincingly. It's a long-range strike platform that is completely dumb. It exists to blop, blop, blop off where it needs to. It is also pushed through by the US Navy for political reasons and destroyed by the United States Air Force for political reasons. Entirely because the United States Air Force is another Air Force which views its entire survivability based on its mon monopoly of the strategic deterrent and strategic bombing capabilities. The US Navy has anything like a capability in that, then that's an existential threat to their existence. Therefore, they must destroy it. Where have we heard this before? Oh yes, the Royal Air Force in the 1920s and 30s. The bomber will always get through. The bomber will win the war. We don't need anything else. It's this many bombers equates to a battleship. I think at one point they worked out that 34 medium bombers equated to one battleship in terms of I think it was destructive. Fi I think it was single salvo firepower, and then it was worked out that yeah, a battleship will deliver that firepower twice a minute. Sometimes more if they're uh, if they've got pre uh, if they've got ready rounds for well. A good hour. Yeah, 
yeah that has the required effect so you start to work out how many medium models really as that is oh and by the way you need to manage to get those medium models into range to support them but there it gone there comes the aircraft car and I cannot overstate this ship actually had its keel laid this ship was that far along what would it have been like well it would have been something special I've been talking recently about benchmark navies in another video and I've been talking a lot about the requirements of navies to maintain their status. The USS United States would have given them that status. Why? Alex, you just said it was terrible. As an aircraft carrier, it truly is. But, as a capability, it would have reshaped the world. It being launched would have been as significant as the USS Enterprise many years later. No, it's not nuclear powered. But the sheer capability it would bring about in terms of the potential strike range would have been nothing short of dramatic. It would have been a strategically mobile strategic attack capability. Ergo, it would have been a geostrategic tool of unfathomable value in diplomatic terms which sounds like a lot of buzzwords so let me break this down basically you will have a strike range the strike range is defined by your let's say your Lockheed P2 Neptune uh, bombers which were supposed to be some of the first ones fitted onto it okay those aircraft have a rough range of 2,157 miles. That's 1,874 nautical miles. So roughly you can draw a 900 nautical mile radius around your carrier battle group. They can drop nuclear weapons anywhere within that 900 mile radius. You then have that coupled with a carrier. Now, that carrier will have had a top speed of roughly 33 knots at least. And will have had, thanks to replenishment C, a near infinite operating radius i.e. it could loiter wherever it needed to be. So, it could sit 200 nautical miles off your coast, well beyond your probable detection range, and launch strikes that could penetrate 700 nautical miles inside your territory and drop bombs which can wipe out a city in a single blow wipe out all the factories everything now here is the interesting consequence of that with that kind of capability you have to expand your defensive depth if you're the Soviet Union, if you're China, everyone that is a world shaping capability quite literally How would it have shaped the world? Well,
Honestly, you cannot see a scenario like this developing with this kind of capability. And the Soviet Union be happy with the US Navy being operate, able to operate anywhere within a thousand nautical miles of their shores. There's not much they can do about it unless they build up a fleet that can prevent them. That would have had an interesting impact on the Cold War. There's also the fact that with such a capability so early in the Cold War, because this is a capability which does come about. Please don't. The thing is, the stopping of these ships, the stopping of the USS United States, does not stop this capability coming about. The US Navy develops this capability. They develop this very much needed long-range strike capability. And you can argue the modern weakness we see in some regards of the modern air wing of carriers and some of the discussions about carriers and the weakness is the fact that we have lost that capability. That is a problem. That is a problem which has come about because, honestly, hubris and overconfidence. Because we haven't had a threat to deal with. There hasn't been a peer threat, so you haven't needed to worry about how far away you need to operate from them. You haven't needed to worry about that kind of scenario. And the trouble is... We've got so many options. We've got we've got missiles. We've got all sorts of things we can use to uh, provide a long-range strike. Tomahawk itself, the standard cruise missile of the Western nations, in terms of sea launch long-range strike, has a roughly thousand nautical mile range. It's great. Why do you need a strike carrier? Why do you need aircraft? Well. Imagine that 1,000 nautical mile range added on to an aircraft which can carry it a 1,000 nautical miles from an airbase which can move anywhere in the world. So you're giving your carrier a strike range of 2,000 nautical miles. doesn't matter if it is even the full 2,000. Let's say it works out at like 1,800 nautical miles. Suddenly, your carriers can move anywhere in the world and can strike anywhere in the world. And yes, we can point to all the modern systems which have been developed to counter such carriers. The fear of such carriers, you know, satellites, all the systems which have been developed to try and track them. But the thing is, you couple a task group, which can bring its own range of capabilities from the escorts, etc. there, with a carrier, with that kind of strike range. You add on maybe the advantages of being able to do air-to-air -air refueling as well, and suddenly you have an incredibly versatile, incredibly scary asset, which can cause trouble to your operations from half a world away. That becomes a factor you have to consider in terms of any operation because it's no longer how long till the carriers get here it's how long till the carriers are in range there's a great example in the defense of British Honduras in the 1970s when HMS Ark Royal is dispatched down because they're being threatened by their neighbor The neighbor has a timeline in their head of how quickly they can take British Honduras, as it was called at the time. Unfortunately for them, before that timeline was able to come into effect, Buccaneer aircraft were flying overhead. It didn't matter how long it would take for the British to get there. What mattered was how long it would take till the British were in range. And that's a Buccaneer aircraft. That's a HMS Ark Royal. That's not a USS United States, which is going to be 83,000 tons plus in fully loaded. Would have been 
let's be honest, well over a thousand feet in length, would have had a flight deck wide enough to stretch some double decker buses out across. And ha it's, and I've included this fact because when I found out, I just thought it was cool to put in here. I know I haven't included it for any other ship and probably never will again, but 20 point and a half feet, 20 and a half feet diameter screws. Four of them. Okay. Just think about how big that is. Think about how small you are compared to that. She's going to have four of them. Not necessarily a large amount of aircraft. 54 fighter aircraft. Up to 18 heavy bombers. Probably 12 normally. So we're talking about an air group of 66 to 72. The thing is, why the fighter aircraft when she can't do her own air defense? Well, those are strike security aircraft. Their job is to provide protection to those bombers. Because the US Navy does not believe the bomber will always get through. They believe the bomber, escorted by a lot of fighters, will blast its way through. At least enough of them will, to drop their payload. A truly massive undertaking. And yes... That's its keel plate being laid. And if we go back to this photo, you can see a few more plates have been laid. I do love the dockyard safety at the time. So. This is cancelled. This is cancelled. If we go back to this lovely image, this is cancelled. And the world is different because of it. Unsurprisingly, it turns out that no you don't have necessarily air bases in all the places in the world you need them uh, you would need you need to be able to defend those air bases and the air bases you were relying on to defend Korea are quickly overrun because they were in Korea oh sugar it's terrible when that happens and you're building up from scratch again you're building up from the bottom again And the thing is, the Americans take a while to get around to developing the actual, the actual supercarrier that comes along. But they always have this at the back of their minds. The strike range, the capabilities this would have offered their carrier battle groups. What do I think happens if this does get built? I don't think there's a lot of them built. I really don't. I think basically the USN probably ends up with two or three of these in service and then someone has the bright idea of probably trying to go for nuclear power early in terms of aircraft carrier design and you have one carrier which can do both roles because you also develop better aircraft which can give you that strike range which is actually what happens even without them in service. But the difference would have been these would have been about a decade and a half, two decades earlier in terms of reaching the maturity. So that would have had an impact in the 1950s and the 1960s. The value of things can often be taught by looking at what would have been if they'd happened. Well, you cannot really predict the world of what would have happened if this had been built because of the differences that would have occurred. But also the value of the thing can be taught by the fates of those who cancel it.
they made a big thing of cancelling it. A Secretary of Navy and a Secretary of Defense go on basically a punishment tour of the US Navy, forcing senior admirals who'd objected to it, who'd revolted, to resign and leave. Punishing them for speaking up against them. Again, there's a lesson in that. Vengeance in victory. You win. Of course you win. You're the big political power. You've pushed for a decision. Do you expect there'll be no resistance? You did? How cute. But the trouble is, the more you push for vengeance, the more you put or retaliate against them, the weaker you position, you make your position if anything goes against you. One of the interesting discussions I have with students often, and this is going to be appropriate for CVA01, which is also coming in this video, is why when the Falklands War happened, did no heads roll of ministers? And the answer is because the ministers who made the decisions were no longer in power. And they could claim, well, you see, we made a decision when we did, but then the world changed. It's a gamble. It's always a gamble. These are, defense procurement is a long-term decision-making process. These ships take years to build. Years to enter service. And governments can change, rise and fall. The world can spin many, many times in that in that period. It will do. Both physically and politically. This carrier is, in many ways, a product of its time. It's giving a strategic capability to the Navy, which is trying to seek a such capability to offset the current technological issues they're having integrating jets and longer-range aircraft into their carrier. As I said, I don't see them being the epitome for very long. But that doesn't really matter. For a short while, they would have been the benchmark in terms of the range of strike they would offer, the capabilities they would offer, and the world would have had to react to them. There are very few ships you have this quality of photograph of at this stage in their construction. The fact that they were doing so shows the value of the ship that it was thought to be. I'd also argue, this is something to consider here, This ship was being built from the keel up in a dry dock. It's being built from the keel up in a place it does not have to go through a traumatic launch. Why? Because as part of its design they tried to put in armor, they put in the strength deck up on the flight deck and that had made it top heavy. And they were doing everything they could to mitigate against any potential problems that could be caused. And someone actually worried about the idea. The idea that she might roll upon launch. If launched conventionally. So the building her in a dry dock.
What's also interesting, and this is something which we should probably consider out as a precedence, is rather like with CVA-01, where HMS Bristol is built, the Type 82, let's call it a destroyer, but let's be honest, small cruiser, which was going to act as a protection ship. The command-like cruiser, USS Northampton, is fully converted and completed for her role as planned to be, originally, was to be the pilot fish, it's called. Um, basically, radar, picket, command center, everything that the United States herself couldn't do. Basically, in order to give the United States the ability to operate the aircraft to achieve the strategic range the US Navy desired, they had to offload all the flagship roles. And this is one of the reasons why I'm interested in next year, maybe making next year the year of the carrier and the flagship, because of how being a flagship from its conception and there being often so few of them, so they were all built as a flagship, has affected the development and design of aircraft carriers. And their approach, you know, their association with higher command. But this was all going to be offloaded to the Northampton. Which you will find a video about in my. I think it's the Oregon class? Light cruisers? Oregon City Heavy. Oregon class heavy cruisers. I think it's in the Treaty Cruiser series of the US Navy. I think I did them. Anyway. That's a cool picture to end on. What have we got coming up? We have got coming up... This goes out when... I think it goes out on Friday? He says, possibly, potentially, more than likely. And Friday is the 1st of September. That'll be cool. And so what we've got coming up is the story of land ships and winning a war. Holzendorf, an unrestricted submarine warfare. That's going to be a fun video. That is a fun video because Holzendorf is an absolute, absolutely amazingly intriguing character. And one of the great things to questions of history to mull upon is what would have happened if it was him rather than Tirpitz who got the Kaiser's ear? Because I think that would have led to a very, very interesting Kaiserlick Marine. Very interesting Kaiserlick Marine. But that's not today's question. Today's question... I have a suspicion how the Soviet Union would respond if this thing was launched and finished. But I wondered what, how you think the allies of the United States might have responded if this, if the United, USS United States had been launched. If CVA-58 had become what she could become, how would France, how would Britain respond? Would they respond? How would they respond? Thank you very much for watching, and, well, I'm going to leave you with this as I go away. Take care.